Hi folks, good to be with you. Uh, love to be with you. We're doing a, a series on the Trinity and uh, we looked at historical reflections on the Trinity, some brief historical thoughts from Lewis Burkhoff, Systematic Theology. Get me on jasonburnspreacher.com, Facebook and Twitter. So we're going to be looking here in this video um, some thoughts, scriptural evidence for the Trinity and uh, we're going to get it from this book. The word Trinity is not quite as expressive as the Holland word uh, Darahid, for it, is, it may simply denote the state of being three without any implication as to the unity of three. It is generally understood, however, that as a technical term in theology, it includes that idea. It goes without saying that when we speak of the Trinity of God, we refer to a trinity in unity and to a unity that is tri trinal. The personality of God and the trinity. As stated in the preceding and communicable attributes of God stressed his personality. Since the revealer is a rational and moral being, his life stands out clearly before us in scripture as a personal life. And it is, of course, of the greatest importance to maintain the personality of God. For without it there can be no religion in the real sense of the word, no prayer, no personal communion, no trustful reliance, and no confident hope. Since man is created in the image of God, we learn to understand something of the personal life of God and of the contemplation of personality as we know it in man. We should be careful, however, not to set up man's personality as a standard by which the personality of God must be measured. The original form of personality is not in man but in God is archetypal while man is ectypal. The latter is not identical with the former but does not contain faint but does contain faint traces of similarity with it. We should not say that a man is personal while God is superpersonal, a very unfortunate term, for what is for what is superpersonal is not personal, but rather that what appears as imperfect in man exists in infinite perfection in God. The one outstanding difference between the two is that man is a unipersonal while God is tripersonal. This tripersonal existence is necessary in the divine being and not in any sense the result of a choice of God. He could not exist in any other than the tripersonal form. This has been argued in various ways. It is very common to argue it from the idea of personality itself. Shed bases his argument on the general self consciousness of the triune God, as distinguished from the particular individual self-consciousness of one of each. Right, I'm going to read that again because it's very interesting. It's very common to argue it from the idea of the personality itself. Shed bases his argument on the general self-consciousness of the triune God, as distinguished from the particular individual self-consciousness of each one of the persons. In the Godhead. For in self consciousness, the subject must know itself as an object and also perceive that it does. This is possible in God because of his trinal existence. He says that God could not be self contemplating, self cognitive, and self communing if he were not trinal in his constitution. Barlett presents an interesting way, a variety of considerations to prove that God is necessary tripersonal. The argument from personality to prove at least a plurality in God can be put in some such form as this. Among men, the ego awakens to consciousness only by contact with the non-ego. Personality does not develop nor exist in isolation, but only in association with other persons. Hence, it is not possible to conceive a personality in God apart from an association of equal persons in him. He, his contact with his creatures would not account for his personality any more sorry, his contact with his creatures would not account for his personality any more than man's contact with the animals would explain his personality. In virtue of the tripersonal existence of God there is an infinite fullness of divine life in him. Paul speaks of his fullness of the Godhead. In view of that fact that where there are three persons in God, it is better to say that God is personal 
than to speak of him as a person. Let's just read that. In view of the fact that there are three persons in God, it's better to say that God is personal than to speak of him as a person. Mm. Let's just read Ephesians 3.19. Ephesians 3.19. To know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Colossians 1 9. Colossians 1 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and in wisdom and spiritual understanding. Mm. So let, let's just think about the argument by Burkhoff using Shedd, Shedd's a reformed theologian, is making the argument that we cannot know our own consciousness unless it's in relation to other consciousnesses. Hmm. That's interesting. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? So, how can God know that he's conscious? Unless it's in relation to someone equal to himself, says Burkhoff. That's a really interesting and, and, and good point. Uh, so basically there is a necessity for the Trinity within God because God would not be aware of his own consciousness Unless he had another consciousness to interact with. Hmm. I think these philosophical arguments, um, I just want to talk about the philosophy and the Trinity. Um, so basically that, that, that's a philosophical argument using psychology, if you notice that he used the word awakens to consciousness only in contact with the non-ego. So I just want to talk about the value of philosophical arguments for the Trinity. What are the values of the philosophical arguments of the Trinity? Um, I think that our opponents will use philosophical arguments against the Trinity, being rationalist, um, Muslims um, who said they have a divine book are rationalist, really, they're using reason, atheist or whatever. So when the atheist and the Muslim and any other person attacking the Trinity say that God cannot be three in one, they're being rationalistic, they're using pure reason to critique that, saying it doesn't make sense, one in three is illogical. And then the Muslim could point out to some disparate, uh, to, to some issues concerning that, for example, um, for example, you can have, um, like a, a Muslim apologist, Mansur, will say, well, if God, if Father rose, Jesus from the dead and Jesus rolled himself from the dead and the spirit rose him from the dead well who rose him from the dead and how can there be three wills 
So these are like philosophical, rationalistic arguments against the Trinity. Um, and then one can counter that by saying, well, the Trinity, you could say, well, um, there are how many dimensions of reality are there? And you could say there are dimensions of reality that we don't know, so it's possible there could be a dimension within the Godhead that we don't fully understand, <clears throat> so your rational arguments don't really fit, because you can't say whether there is a dimension beyond what you understand that would <coughs> have an explanation, but as yet we can't fully understand. The Muslim might reply, well, it's not logical, one plus one plus one is one. <coughs> Sorry, it's three. <coughs> and, uh, but we're not talking about abstract numbers, we're talking about the being of God, which is much more um, infinitely greater and requires a sense of humility because God is infinite. And we cannot fully grasp and understand God. <coughs> and the only way that we can fully or partly understand God is that God reveals to us. And he's revealed to us in his scripture that he is a triune God. So, philosophical arguments against the Trinity fail because they try to do too much. Because the finite cannot fully, fully understand the infinite. <coughs> On the other hand, there are philosophical arguments that can be used to defend the Trinity. For example, this argument here about consciousness. Then you can have the argument about the one and the many. Um, History has always tried to understand reality. Uh, sorry, philosophies always try to understand reality. And philosophy has discussed that there are many, that, that, uh, that reality is one. But that reality has many parts. But yet, the two together, there's triunity. There's one reality, but yet many parts. And the Trinity shows why there are met one, one reality and many parts. It's a reflection of the character of God, who is one and three. The Trinity helps us to understand society, why we're relational, why we, why human beings are, are in families and tribes and nations and why human beings are relational because God by very nature being a triune God is relational. So the Trinity you can use philosophical arguments to defend the Trinity like that but ultimately we have to be careful because Christians are not rationalist we are revelationist we believe in the revelation of the Word of God. The Word of God. And so we must be careful not to be sidetracked by the Muslim who wants to go down the rabbit hole of philosophical arguments and those who want to defend with philosophical arguments. We must be careful that this is a rabbit hole that we cannot really fully explain the Trinity. And we must always pull back and say, no, wait a minute, we believe the Bible is the word of God. What do the scriptures teach? So... So that's, that's a discussion on philosophy and the Trinity. So we, we've looked at the relationship between philosophy and the Trinity. That we, to, we must be very, very careful, very careful, not to get sidetracked to become rationalist. Because if we become rationalist, we lose the power of the gospel, we lose the power of the word of God. Remember, whenever you're having a discussion, it's the power of the word, it's the power of the word of God that is effective. Now, we're all tempted to try and give a rational justification. And we can do that to our best ability, but we must be careful to anchor what we say and ultimately present everything that we say grounded in the scripture. And it's the scripture that can speak for itself. So we must be careful not to get bogged down with philosophical arguments for the Trinity because in the end they don't have any power and in the end both sides can't fully understand the nature of God it comes down in the end back to scripture 
and what scripture says. So those are my thoughts about the philosophy and the Trinity, looking at the relationship between philosophy and the Trinity. Okay, I hope that's been a blessing. And I know that many of the great theologians of the past, like uh, the Cappadocian Fathers and Tertullian and many others, were brilliant at philosophy. But they kept their philosophical reflections grounded in the pure word of God when it came to the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, God bless you.